games make failure fun. That's something about games that most of us actually don't realise is that in a game, failing is actually what you want to do. If you're playing a game like Angry Birds or Candy Crush and there's a button that just says win, you wouldn't hit that button because it is the participation and failure and doing better than you did last time why you continue to do it. Now, we always say you can't make, it doesn't work in every case. If there was a button that said click here to finish your tax return, I'd hit the button. There's no fun for me <laughs> in tax returns, but if you're an accountant, it might be your idea of fun doing the tax return. So different things in different games have different responsibilities for us and different response. But the fact that games make failure fun and the reason we come back to them is one of the reasons why they're so successful, particularly in the field of mental health. Because mental health is often about making the failure that you're having in how you feel like you're addressing your life better. In the case of trying to give up smoking, failing in giving up smoking makes you try again rather than feeling you can't. So this idea of failure is something that I'm going to be having a look at across the sorts of things that we've done. Um, I'm not going to touch much on us. We do digital stuff. We started in entertainment, then we got into health. And the reality is that it's what we do in entertainment that makes what we do in health work. Entertainment is about things which are engaging and fun. And a lot of that stuff is also games, but sometimes it's about visual things. And that's what's really important. And there are four key elements about persuasive change or persuasive technology or behavioural change that really come from that, which is that there's four, four key things. It has to be entertaining. It has to have a competitive element to it. it strong visualisation and strong visual clues. clues and there should be a reward of some sort. So those are four things that you kind of look at any time you want to create something which is in this persuasive uh, behavioural change type space. You don't do all of them all the time, but some of those techniques will be the ones that exist. And the interesting thing about games and game mechanics and game dynamics and what we call the DMA of games um, is this whole idea that games actually fulfil all the things that sit in Maslow's hierarchy of needs that games will, will answer your requirements for status and reward, achievement and self-expression in some form by doing all these things. So this is what games do. So from this, what can we learn about trying to fulfil people's behaviour? Well, one of the things you need to do is make it a bit hard because the one thing we all get bored with is games which are too easy. I know a lot of people who've played, or well, my sister in particular, plays Angry Birds and she plays each round of Angry Birds until she gets three stars because that's the way she plays it. She finds it frustrating if it's too easy. She wants to make it hard on herself. That's the way she does that. So the game mechanic Zen is about giving people a challenge in their life or in a game, which is not that easy to do, but which feels rewarding to do and is, has enough frustration in it to make you want to keep on going. And this is that frustration is that failure element. So I'm going to look at a service that we did in, in a bit more detail, which is called My Quit Buddy. We were commissioned by the Australian National Preventative Health Agency, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now the Department of Health. And the whole brief we had of this was make it effective. We want something that will really help people give up smoking. Now, this project started almost five years ago, and I'll show you the video that was made by them to give you a, a quick overview of the app at the time. amazing how the model of an iPhone that you use in an ad can date it. Um, <laughs> so I thought that would be a good one to put at the very beginning. Uh, the app is now available on iOS and Android and on Windows phones too. Uh, it's free to download and I'll just mention we've had 675,000 downloads. It's mainly available in Australia. That would suggest that 25% of Australian smokers have been across this app at some point. And, and the thing that, is most, that I love most is that I'll go to a conference 
and I'll say to somebody, you know, they'll say, what do you do? And I'll say, we make apps, we made a quit smoking app. And they'll go, oh, my dentist has told me about this one, or my doctor has. People recommend my quit buddy to me, and I love that because it says it works. But there's a couple of things in here that I want to look at specifically. So in games, there's something called progression dynamics, which is about how you progress through it. Social media uses this. Most of you, I bet, have seen your LinkedIn profile at some point say, 60% complete, give us your schooling in your progression dynamics, right? And we all get this on frequent flyer programs. Your frequent flyer program says you're six points away from your next status upgrade, progression dynamics. And we use progression dynamics. <clears throat> when you first, when the app opens, it starts off with this blue body. Um, the blue body, you're a smoker, you're unhealthy. And over the course of the time that you're, you give up smoking, your body gets filled with gold. Um, there's a very funny story about Catholic education behind why we do this, but I'll, I'll tell you that another time. Uh, and there are these things that tick over. So you saw those numbers. Those numbers up the top will go tick, 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 tick. This is something which is compelling. We love ticking things. We love things counting up. So they will count up. And, as, and these are screenshots I just took as we went through. So you can see the body gets filled with gold when you open up the app. And so you can see this immediately. Your body's getting full and the numbers are ticking. We always see a body as representing ourselves. It's just something that we as humans do. So suddenly this is personalised. That's my body in there. And there's 30 days there. We'll talk about that one. That is personal best. That's my personal best so far. Um, or the counter of where I'm up to. There's a little share button down the bottom there. And each time I open the app for the first two weeks, I'm given a little reward about something beneficial that's happened to my body. And the app will open on something similar to this last slide here, telling me that within a week your sense of smell and taste improves. And those little factoids, as we call them, they're all facts, pop up and they grow over time. So the app opens on something that feels like it's rewarding me by giving me some information. And you can see it's highly visual. Uh, the personal best, if I, tap on, if I tap on the 30 there, that little 30 there with that number on it, it brings up the personal best screen. Now, this, this, my personal best now is the same as it was. But what we do in this app is that for the first week every day, for the second week every two days, and for the third week on an ongoing cycle, we ask if you're still smoke free. And we call it the slip up test because we say, are you still smoke free or did you slip up? And if you say, I'm smoke free, that's it. But if you say I slipped up, the next question is, was it just a slip up or do you need to restart your program? And if you say it's just a slip up, you get a nice little message that says, that's okay. Sometimes this stuff's tough, stick with it. You know, try and, I, try and learn from, from what your mistake was. And that's the slip up test and we don't restart your program. But of the people who say they've slipped up, 67% of them do restart their program themselves. So what we have is people who are honestly choosing to restart their program because they failed. But in that failure that they did when they had that cigarette, we didn't say, oh, bad smoker, that's it. You know, and they would have got rid of the app. We kind of said, yes, slip ups happen. And if I had slipped up and restarted my program, my personal best goes back to the beginning again. So the competition is with me. Can I do better than I've done before in the way that I'm giving up smoking? I can set what we call danger times, and I've set two here that leaving work at five past five every day, something will pop up that goes, stay strong. Because at five past five, as I walk out of the office, I have a habit of wanting to light a cigarette. And on Saturday mornings, when I wake up and go, it's the weekend, I'll have a cigarette, 10 o'clock in the morning, that's another danger time. You can set as many danger times as you want. The way we structured the app, we will never send you more than three alerts in a day. That's kind of our view is like more than three alerts, you get rid of it off your phone. And in fact, we'll only ever do that twice. We then drop immediately to two alerts a day. So only if you've set your own danger times do we actually ever send you more than those two alerts in there. The next one is these ticking numbers that you saw. They tick up and you can hit what you call the stats page on there. Now, <coughs> that stats page is, is, is something, the dashboard, this screen that you have here, and that stats page are the two key areas of the site that it turned out users absolutely loved. And one of the things you saw is what we call the scratchy. If you're craving and you want a little bit of assistance, we give you a reinforcing message. If you're still craving, we give you a little panel that you can scratch off like a scratchy. And it might have a message underneath that you yourself put in the system to motivate you or your family put in there or a photo of why you're giving up smoking. Um, but it's just something to help reinforce you and keep your hands busy. And if you're still craving after that, we give you a game because that's going to keep you busy for seven minutes. And that's about how long a craving starts. Now, the app has gone through about nine iterations. We're, we're just on iteration nine at the moment. One of the things we discovered was people wanted to say exactly when they gave up smoking, not have us assume that it was at midnight. They wanted to say exactly how much it cost them for 20 cigarettes, not have us tell them what the average was. They also wanted to be able to, to share it with people. And we discovered that because we went onto Instagram one day and discovered that there are a thousand snapshots taken from my Quit Buddy loaded up onto Instagram under the, the Quit Buddy tag. 
And these are people sharing their successes and their journeys and their correspondence and having another cigarette. Um, and you can see there. So we put that share button down the bottom there so people would be able to share that. So that kind of gives you an idea of the sorts of gamified elements that we've put in here into what's been now assessed as one of the, the single most successful way of giving up smoking, six times more successful than medical intervention. So the thing is, I do think people who download My Quit Buddy want to give up smoking and those who stick with it do. We've got extraordinary statistics behind it. And there's a community participation element in there where people leave messages for each other and we have more than 25,000 active participants. And see that 800 days smoke free? So that's somebody who gave up smoking, what, nearly three years ago? We have people who gave up smoking five years ago who download the app just because they want to see how much money they've saved or how much tire they haven't had or all those sorts of things. So it's an incredible reinforcement about the journey that people have been on. And some of those techniques we've used in other areas and I'm going to touch on a couple of them. We worked with St Vincent's Hospital on an app called This Way Up, a series of apps. There's one on anxiety, one on depression, one on social phobia, one on OCD. There's about five or six in them and it's based on a program they have. This is highly visual. So you go through the journey um, on This Way Up. There are eight lessons, if it, or roughly eight lessons. You go through a lesson and then you can't do another lesson for at least a week. Now this denial is another game mechanic that you can't do all eight lessons in one go. You have to let the first lesson sink in before you can start on the second lesson. And the visualization of it just really lets you understand what it's a bit like to be depressed or how you deal with it. The fascinating thing about this is that they have a 75% improvement in, in how people are feeling about their mental health as a result of this. There is zero downside. And we all know that there's drugs have downside, depression, antidepressants have downside. So this one is gamified very, very lightly using just some mechanics about denial and about visual and about entertaining. We did it again with, uh, with trying to get young kids to tell us, or young adults to tell us about their mental health. You know, were they being bullied? Were they having unprotected sex? Were they, were they doing self-harm? Were they taking too many illegal drugs or drinking too much? And the way that we did it was by asking them questions which were more fun to answer. If you take this slider about what time you go to bed and slide it down, it will get progressively dark and the moon will come up. So you see the kids going the slider up and down three or four times before they set it at what time they go to bed. Here they get to swipe activities left and right as to what they like to do and what they don't like to do. The end result of this was that the, all of the participants said that they had enjoyed doing the survey and they felt they had a better relationship with their doctor because they'd actually told them more truth about what was going on in their lives than they had at other times. The doctors said that they, the clients actually expected more from them and were more willing to participate in the programs as a result of this. So this, this veracity of information was really good. We did one on teaching doctors how to, be, how to deliver bad news better. It was an artificial intelligence uh, simulator using a woman whose husband's died and you had to go and explain to her that he died. It, it used this idea where people self-assessed how they felt they had gone and we told them how they thought they went so they could try and get some learning out of this. But it was in this sort of game environment where you're, you're, you're going through this quite serious scenario been in a video environment. And we've recently delivered four apps for HCF of which the one that I think is the most interesting one is, is called Be Happier. And it includes breathing exercises and meditation techniques and, and a whole lot of visualizations and, and personal messages. But you can see there, there's badges and there's gamified elements. Again, there's another version of the body being filled there. We use these strong visual elements and these rewards in terms of achievements to kind of like encourage you to stick with a, a program to, to go through a meditation or breathing exercises. But I kind of want to finish on one thing which came up as a result of, of, of this research and the work we're doing. And BJ Fogg out of Stanford University is probably one of the most influential people in the whole idea of persuasive technologies. He's f fabulous. He, he, an extraordinary number of, of millionaires have come out of his classes, including the co-founder of Instagram. You know, he taught them how to use persuasive technologies to get us to use these things. His three key mantras are get specific. So everything we do, we look at get specific. Make it easy and trigger the behavior. So how can we trigger this behavioral change? Um, and there's a nice little graph that he's got about the key things that you do. And there's a little dot, something you do once. For example, I'll look at this. Something you do once, put a solar powered system on the ceiling. Something that you do regularly, turn off your air conditioners and something that becomes a lifelong behavior. And I'm just using the climate change as an example. But it's a great way of developing ongoing climate change. But you have to tread carefully in this. What's happening now is people are looking at these persuasive technologies and saying, how can we use them for good, but not necessarily to influence what people are doing? And I'm just going to leave you with this last one. It's a group coming out of Lancaster in, in the UK, attached to Lancaster University. And they've got a little project called BARTA, the BARTA project. And it consists of both an app and a website. And the only thing they want to do is encourage people in Lancaster 
to actually think of spending their money locally. Now, I live in Balmain, and I've got to tell you, this would work in Balmain. Those of us who live in Balmain would love to spend our money in Balmain. We used to have a Balmain rewards card. I think those of you who live in other areas have probably got the same thing. People who live in the peninsula want to stay on the peninsula. People who live in the Shire would love to shop in the Shire. How can we benefit our local communities? The only thing they did was a visualisation. So when you go into a shop and spend some money, if you use the Barter app, then what it will do is show you where that money is going around the community. And it's just a way of trying to encourage you to spend your money in the community and not see it going back to London or overseas. But the really interesting thing is what they wanted to do was not make people spend more. So they were really careful in their use of the persuasive technologies because not spending more was the absolute key objective that they had. So it's a really interesting area to play in this idea of behavioural change. We're currently working on a methamphetamine program where we don't tell you taking ice is bad, but we try and make sure that you're in control of your ice addiction. Uh, and in these terms, how can that persuasive technology let you know that you might have a problem, let you know you might need to do some change, not make you feel bad, let you know that failure is okay, make that failure fun, but still look at that idea of behavioural change. So that's all. It's a fun space to work in. Thanks very much. <laughs>